Welcome to my operations management video on forecasting accuracy. My students can access the video tutorials for these problems using the content menu in D2L. YouTube viewers can access the video tutorials on my MOOC on Udemy.com. I have a long and short version of the URL posted on the screen, and I will post this URL in the description. Forecasts are always wrong, although I wouldn't suggest you try that excuse with your professor on an exam. Actual demand is just too complex to accurately forecast. This is true no matter how complicated the mathematics behind your forecasting model. With models like exponential smoothing and weighted moving averages, we need a way to compare different weights as well. In statistics, we call the difference between actual and measured values a residual. In forecasting, we call them an error. There are two types of errors, random and bias. You can think about bias as mistakes. We're always going to have random error. That's the definition of random. You can't forecast it. Bias is much worse. You shouldn't have bias in your forecast. I've always figured that being a weather forecaster would be a good job. After all, you can get it wrong every day and keep your job. But really, the job of a forecaster is not to get it right because forecasts are always wrong. The job of a forecaster is to get it good enough. So if the weather forecaster tells me it's going to be 86 today, I know what to wear. If it turns out to be 84 or 88, I still made the right decision. That small error in the forecast doesn't affect how useful it was to me. The second thing that a forecaster should try to do is continuously improve the forecast. Continuous improvement is a big part of operations management. There are three primary measures of forecasting accuracy. The mean absolute deviation, or the MAD, the mean squared error, or MSE, and the mean absolute percent error, or MAPE. The MAD is just the average absolute forecast error. It's the most common way of measuring forecast error. Every forecasting package I've ever seen would give you the MAD. It works well for selecting smoothing constants in exponential smoothing, for example, or weights in a weighted moving average. The mean squared error is equivalent to the variance in statistics. It is the average of the squared forecast errors. The mean absolute percent error averages the percentage errors. Here you see the formulas for the three approaches on the screen. As you can see, the MAD is just the absolute value of the actual minus forecast summed up divided by N. MSE is just the actual minus the forecast squared summed up and divided by N minus 1, just like you divide a variance by N minus 1 in statistics. The MAPE is a little more complicated. You take the actual minus forecast and take the absolute value of that, divide it by actual to convert it to a ratio, multiply it times 100 to convert it to a percentage, and then add them up and divide by n to get the average. The MAD is easiest to compute. It weights every error linearly. It's easy to understand. It's widely used. Mean squared error gives you squared error terms. It's roughly equivalent to the MAD value squared. However, it gives more weight to larger errors, so they're not exactly equivalent, and you need it for control charts. Neither the MAD nor the mean squared error is any good for comparing forecasts between products with largely different volumes. That's because the magnitude of the numbers depend on the volume. So if you sold men's blue jeans at one volume and sold four times as many women's blue jeans, the MAD for the women's forecast would be higher even if it did a better job. That's what the mean absolute percent error is for. By converting everything to a percentage, it puts the errors in perspective and allows for meaningful comparisons between different forecasts on different products. So where does forecast error come from? Forecasting models tend to be fairly simplistic. As such, they can't include everything. So usually the model is inadequate, that is, it doesn't cover everything. Irregular variations, we've talked about those. The Olympics coming to town, a wild football game. Less common is incorrect use of the forecasting technique, using, say, simple exponential smoothing when you've got a trend component. And finally, something in the underlying demand that has changed something in the marketplace or something in the demographics or something a competitor has done. In terms of controlling the forecast, there are two techniques, the tracking signal and control charts. On the screen, you see the formula for the tracking signal. The first formula is in words, the second formula is in symbols, but they're the same formula. I do want to mention that the Stevenson textbook from McGraw-Hill does tracking signals differently. I know that because that's the one we use at my university. If you're using that textbook and you're looking for a video to show you how to do tracking signals, make sure you get one dedicated to the Stevenson approach. It's an unusual approach and I don't think anybody else uses it. The tracking signal generates one value for each period. Those values can be positive or negative. A perfect value is zero, but you'll rarely get that. Anything between plus and minus four is acceptable. Anything larger than plus four or smaller than negative four indicates forecast bias. In other words, you need to correct the forecast. You've got a bias in the forecast. You've got a consistent error in the forecast. And you need to go in and figure out what's causing it so you can correct it. 
A control chart is a visual tool for monitoring forecast error, and I'll show you one in a moment. They come out of quality control, so hopefully you've covered the quality control chapter first. However, I know that the Stevenson textbook that we use covers forecasting before quality control, so you might not have seen this before. It's made up of four pieces of information, the upper control limit, the lower control limit, the center line, which for forecasting is always zero, and that's not true in quality control, and then the data. Another point about quality control is that you never allow the lower control limit to be negative. If the calculations end up being negative, you make it zero, which can happen with a P chart and a C chart. For forecasting, the lower control limit on a quality control chart is always negative. Here you see a typical control chart on the screen. The line at the top is the uh, upper control limit. The red line in the center is the center line. The blue line at the bottom is the lower control limit. The points are successive values for forecast error. Some books and some software will connect the dots with a straight line. It doesn't add any value. It's not meaningful and doesn't matter. In order to construct a control chart, you first need the mean squared error that we discussed earlier. As I mentioned back then, the mean squared error estimates the variance of the distribution of errors. So we compute the standard deviation as the square root of the mean squared error. The upper control limit is z times s. We almost always use values of 2 or 3 for a z. Basically, what we're doing is constructing a confidence interval around 0. Remember, the center line is always 0. The lower control limit is negative z times s. And then the points are just the forecast errors. Here you see that written as formulas. S is equal to the square root of MSE. The upper control limit is equal to z times s. Center line equals 0. The lower control limit equals negative z times s. And remember, there are tutorials available on this on either udemy.com or in D2L, depending on whether you're one of my students or you're watching this on YouTube. So how do we choose a forecast technique? First, recognize that no technique is always best. The two most important factors are cost and accuracy. Now, with computer software, you might think cost is not so much of an issue, and that is truer today than it has been in the past, but the more complicated the forecasting technique you use, the more experienced of an analyst you need, and therefore the higher the salary. Other factors to consider are how much historical data is available and how clean it is, how time-consuming is it to gather the data that you need if you don't have it already, and how far out into the future you want to go. So what do you do when the forecast is wrong? As I mentioned earlier, the forecast is always wrong. But here what I mean is what do you do when the forecast is too wrong for it to be attributed to forecasting error? Well, it could be that you're using the wrong technique. Maybe you're using a linear technique like regression and you've got a curvilinear demand. You can spot a lot of those kinds of problems by charting the data. Maybe there's something going on with the data that's just not included in the forecast. For example, you're trying to forecast residential electric sales using historical sales and you're not looking at the new houses being built. Maybe someone reacted to the forecast and caused a deviation. For example, you forecasted you were going to sell 20000 and marketing knew you were going to produce 30000 So marketing ran a sale or a promotion that caused demand to go up. Your forecast is now wrong, but that's wrong in a good way. Somebody didn't like the result and reacted to it. That's what you want to have happen. Let's look at three specific scenarios about the forecast being wrong. Adding a large customer, losing a large customer, and a temporary disruption. And for each one of these, I'm going to use a Georgia Power example. Atlanta has a transit system called the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, or MARTA for short. In 1979, they opened their first rail line. The trains ran on electricity and used an ungodly amount of electricity. If you look at the chart on the right, you see we get a spike when MARTA started. I'm not sure it was that large, but uh, it's good for illustration. If Georgia Power had not been ready for all of that electric demand, there might have been brownouts or blackouts. If you're in a competitive industry, you might lose a customer if you're not ready for their demand. So what do you do? After all, you can't really inventory electricity, at least not much. This is why forecasting is located in the marketing department. The marketing department would have known for months or years that MARTA was coming and that it was going to use a lot of electricity. Your marketing department would know for months or years that a new customer was coming into your area and was going to have a high demand. They're feeding that information to forecasting so they can build it into their forecast. And then forecasting is feeding that information to production so they can be included in their production plans. So by the time MARTA opened, Georgia Power was ready for all of that demand. What about losing a customer? On the outskirts of downtown Atlanta, there used to be a steel mill called Atlantic Steel. They operated from 1901 to 1998. During its heyday, it employed 2,300 workers and produced 750 tons of steel annually. When it was open, it was Georgia Power's single largest customer. And then it wasn't. It went bankrupt. You can see a chart on the screen where we had a drop in demand for electricity. 
It probably wasn't that large. I'm doing that for so you can see it easily. Currently, that land has been reclaimed and there's an office building there. It doesn't use remotely the same amount of electricity as the steel mill did, so that demand is gone. If Georgia Power hadn't been ready for it, we'd have excess production. If that happened to a manufacturing company and they weren't ready for it, they'd build up a huge amount of extra inventory. Again, marketing knew that was coming, and we were able to build that into our plans, and that's why forecasting is in the marketing department. Hey, what about a temporary disruption? In 1996, the Olympics came to Atlanta. I'm showing that as a positive spike on the chart, but I'm not sure that's the case. I had left Georgia Power by that time, but a lot of businesses in downtown Atlanta shut down because they didn't figure their employees and their customers could get through the Olympics traffic to shop there or work there. So it could be the spike is negative, and, and it really it doesn't matter. Temporary disruption can be positive or negative. In the case of the Olympics, marketing knew it was coming, but you don't always know it's coming. A flood, a hurricane, bad weather, things like that happen, and you may not know they're coming at least in time to do anything about them. With manufacturing, you have to deal with it with inventory. If demand is lower than expected, build up inventory. If demand is higher than expected, draw down inventory. Dealing with it with services is much more difficult. My forecasting lectures conclude with the next video. It's called Closing Remarks. I'll put a link to it in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please click like and consider subscribing to this channel.